Hi, my name is Tim Becker. I'm the director of horticulture at the Theodore Payne Foundation. We're out here today in the Santa Monica Mountains in an area that was burned during the Topanga Fire in 2021 in mid-May. Uh, it burned well over a thousand acres and we're here today to look at the natural process of ecological recovery in a burn area. Fire is an intrinsic part of life on planet Earth. Fire and plants continue to interact with each other to renew life, to renew vegetation in terrestrial environments. A lot of our plants here in California uh, need fire. They, what we would call pyrophiles are actually, they need that fire in order to uh, either open their fruit or their cone, as in the case of the lodgepole pine, or in some plants that uh, have an internal dormancy mechanism, meaning they're in a state of suspended animation until the conditions are, are right. They only germinate when chemicals in the smoke released by burning plant material are released and then rain kind of soaks those seeds in that chemical, causing them to germinate and take advantage of the lack of competition, which is really what fires do. They kind of, they wipe the slate clean. There is now water, light, all the resources needed for plants to thrive. And so what you see immediately after a fire is a lot of annuals. So those are plants that grow, flower, get pollinated and set seed in one year. And their whole strategy, if you will, is to produce copious amounts of seed, put those down at the seed bank for one, two, three years after the fire. And then those seeds, again, will lay dormant in that state of suspended animation until a fire comes through. This one particular species, the Malacothamnus fasciculatus, the chaparral, bush mallow. It needs that scarification, that kind of abrasion from the heat to end actually in order to germinate. So you can just see like thousands of seedlings just right before us. There's a lot of different adaptations to fire. You know, how does a plant come back from a disturbance uh, like a huge fire that decimates all the vegetation? Well, one of the more simple mechanisms is that a lot of plants have underground storage mechanisms. Think bulbs, think rhizomatous plants that spread all over. Um, we'll look at a lot of different plants that have thick rhizomatous uh, root systems which are low enough down in the ground to actually not burn. And so as soon as their vegetation is cut back, much in the way that you see a plant come back if you've coppiced it or cut it all the way to the ground in the spring. So those rhizomes re-sprout from underneath the ground um, and that's how they're adapted to that fire. Bulbs, they have an underground storage mechanism which completely disappears every year in the summer and so those are secure underground. Other plants have a mechanism where they have a very thick woody uh, root kind of crown which allows them to re-sprout after their vegetation is gone. We're going to see a lot of those plants today. Um, some of them are right around us. We have um, this Rhamnus alyssifolia we have toyon, we have oaks, we have um, chemise. A number of these chaparral shrubs come back from what are known as lignotubers or burls at the base of the plant. And those lignotubers are full of starch and energy in order to help produce these new shoots. And these plants are able to regrow very quickly because they have a massive root system. They still retain that root system that was supporting a large 20, 30 year old shrubs. So they're able to sequester a lot of the nutrients released by the fire, all the potassium and phosphorus that's produced in the wood ash and put down into the soil, all of that carbon and regrow quite quickly. Still other plants are obligate cedars, uh, meaning that they actually need that fire, that smoke, those chemicals produced in order to germinate. We talked a little bit about the annuals, which are obligate cedars, those phacelias, the antirhinums, the papaver californicum, the fire poppy. Other perennial plants also are obligate cedars, and those plants are ones that live more than two years. Arctostaphylus glauca, the big berry manzanita, is a great example. So the entire plant will be burned down to the ground. It will not re-sprout, but what you'll see in a post-fire environment is a lot of seedlings of manzanita, particularly Arctostaphylus glauca in our region. Our other locally native manzanita, Arctostaphylus glandulosa, actually has 
burls and, and crown re-sprouts. So you can see two different adaptations even within the same genus for this fire recovery process. We've moved down from the chaparral into an area dominated a lot more by tree species. In this case, we're looking at the coast live oak, Quercus agrifolia. Um, in this fire, it appeared to actually be a crown fire where the fire actually reached all the way to the top of the canopy of all the vegetation. In a lot of instances, a crown fire, if it's hot and intense enough, can actually kill a tree like a coast live oak. But we can see another adaptation, which is just simply nascent buds that are deep enough in that woody tissue that they will lie dormant through a fire and then re-sprout when conditions are right the following spring. Part of the process in a um, area that has just experienced a fire is a process known as ecological succession. This is a process by which a lot of fast-growing organisms, annuals, uh, quick to grow or uh, perennials um, dominate the area quite rapidly. In the first year after a fire, that's actually when you have the highest amount of biodiversity because you still have a lot of those crown sprouting shrubs, but you also have these organisms that are taking advantage of a narrow window, this little opportunity in a sliver of time when they can dominate and they can reproduce and have their moment to create a huge seed bank. So you see that with annuals like the phacelias and the poppies, but you also see that with perennials like this Malacathamnus fasciculatus and the calisthesia macrostesia. So these are two organisms that are dominating the environment right now, um, creating mass coverage, which has a lot of ecological benefits, right? This is preventing erosion. These plants are often creating what we call nursery conditions where slower growing shrubs have protection from predation from herbivores and reduced exposure to the sun. So underneath all this vegetation are other organisms slowly making their way back to become the dominant species. So a lot of these plants that we're seeing now are actually gonna fade away as the larger woody shrubs come to dominate, shade them out and outcompete them. And again, during this time, they're producing copious quantities of seed and and loading that seed bank up. So in Southern California, in chaparral systems, you would naturally see a fire every 30 to 40 years. Now, as humans have encroached in wildlands and we continually to cause more and more fires, that fire regime as it increases or the, the, the frequency with which fires occurs, that ability for these plants to regenerate is compromised because a lot of our plants are not able to reach the age of maturity enough to reproduce offspring. So how can we as Californians best support the process of ecological recovery in a post-fire environment? Well, the best approach is really to do nothing. Recovery will happen over time. And what you can do is simply appreciate the beauty in that transition. If you are interested in learning more about post-fire regeneration or how you can support habitat in the post-fire environment, check out the resources in the description below.